Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Micro Moment with Microbi Gals. I'm Tess. And I'm John. And in today's Crowcast, it's going to be really fun. You know what we're doing, John? Something spooky. Something spooky. It's October, which means it's Halloween time. And we're going to talk about 13 monstrous microbes. Woo! Spooky. So to start us off, so just everyone knows, we are doing 13. It's a countdown. We're talking about microbes and their relation to some of our spooky Halloween characters that we all love and adore. To kick things off, we're going to talk about Boreella burkadorferi. Is that how I say that? Um, I'm going to defer to you. You're a lot better at uh, saying the nomenclature than I am. I always say when you're talking micro nomenclature, if you just say it fast and kind of slur your words, no one can say you're wrong. So we're going to start um, with their association with vampires. So what do the vampires remind you of, John? Mm, I'm reminded of cinematography when it comes to vampires. There's so many movies when it comes to vampires. That is true. So vampires typically stem from Bram Stoker's novel, Count Dracula, which some believe is based off of Vlad the Impaler. Now others, some people don't believe it's off of Vlad the Impaler, but let me just tell you a few facts about Vlad the Impaler and you can tell me if that reminds you of a vampire. He lived in Transylvania. Check. In the 15th century. Check. And he liked to impale his victims with wooden stakes. I'd say another check. Um, and then he dipped bread in the blood of his dying victims. Kind of check. So it's very close to like drinking the blood of your victims. Your yeah. victims. So we're going to go with Vlad the Impaler was a pretty big inspiration for Dracula, if not. So what does it have to do with microbes? Well, Borella burkadorferi, if you don't know, is the causal agent of Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is transmitted by ticks, which are blood sucking pests. While there are lots of pathogens which are vectored by blood sucking pests, think of mosquitoes or ticks, uh, Borella burkadorferi has always been very interesting to me. And growing up in the Northeast, it is also something spooky that our parents always tell us to try to avoid growing up. So I guess I just have a particular fondness? I mean, not only that, I mean, us living in the New England area, that's where it was discovered. Yeah, so Lyme disease actually stems from Lyme, Connecticut, where it was first found. And vampires um, are all found in Transylvania. So both of these started out as endemic uh, diseases occurring in just a small area. However, just like Twilight popularized vampires a decade ago, um, Lyme disease is spreading across America and can now be found in upper Midwestern and Northeastern United States, making it become a dangerous epidemic. And it's fastly growing as an infectious disease in the US. So the CDC reports that about 300,000 people are infected each year with Lyme disease and 25% being children. Now, it's very easy to contract Lyme disease. Um, ticks are found all over the place in long grasses. So if you're particularly fond of hiking, uh, you will likely have been bitten by a tick and could be uh, at risk of getting this disease. In 2020, as the pandemic made us all um, disperse from common crowds, everyone flocked to the fields and the forests um, and found a new love for hiking. So I would actually think that in 2020, we might see an increase in Lyme disease. What do you think? I think you're uh, onto something there. I mean, when we went hiking, we saw a lot more people camp or hiking and camping. We saw a lot more people there than we normally do. Yeah. So just as a PSA, uh, if you are going outside in the woods, always make sure you check for ticks um, on yourself, on your kids, and even your fur babies. Um, dogs can easily get ticks and it can be fatal. And because they have all that fur, uh, it, it can be hard to find too. So vampires are generally depicted as tall, slender, and pale creatures having a distinct silhouette. 
And we can connect this to Borrelia burgdorferi um, based on its morphology. So we're talking about morphology, we're talking about the shape of the microbe. And Borrelia burgdorferi is a, a spirochete, which means it's long, slender, in spiral or corkscrew in shape. So this is a rather rare morphology. Usually we have um, cocci, uh, which are circular microbes, and rod shapes. Uh, but does it see its own reflection? Oh, that one I'm not sure of. We'll have to do some research, I guess. Uh, but it can change its shape. Well, there we go. Much like um, vampires, some vampire legends, you can they change into bats, um, which always reminds me of the magic school bus. Did you see that episode? No, I didn't see that episode. Oh, it's one of my favorite episodes of the Magic Fool School Bus. Is <laughs> the Miss, Magic Fool Bus? The Magic Fool Bus. Oh, I was going to say Miss Frizzle um, turns all the parents into bats, or the kids think so. And so they think they're like, parents are part of a cult. And the, the kids are all trying to save their parents from Miss Frizzle. It's a good one. Any rate, the shape of shifting that Borella does is called an antigenic shift or an antigenic change. And so basically it's changing the way that it functions. So it's more um, adapted to the environment that it's in. So it has one personality for the tick and one personality for the human. So this transformation usually takes about 36 hours. It's not quite as fast as our vampires just shifting into a bat. But um, if you can catch it within this 36 hours, it does mean that you can prevent Lyme disease. However, if you've ever had a tick, you never really know how long they've been on you. And Lyme disease can be really hard and difficult to diagnose too, because it can manifest in people in, in a lot of different ways. That's actually a big debate as of recently. I remember not even five years ago, um, doctors still arguing if uh, long lasting effects of Lyme disease are even a thing or not. So where are some of these symptoms? So generally when you first get Lyme disease, you can get a red ring or target that surrounds the bite. This is followed by fever, headaches, heart and central nervous system conditions. Um, late stages of the disease can manifest as arthritis, encephalopathy, and chronic encephalomyeloma. Can you say those words? Encephalopathy or chronic encephalomyelitis. John is way better at saying medical terms than me. Um, yeah, so you could have lifelong medical issues, but again, this is under debate with the scientific and medical community. Um, of, of how this manifests and whether it is attributed to Lyme disease. So our next microbe is Clostridium botulinum, or what we like to think of as mummy. So unlike Frankenstein, werewolves, and Dracula, mummies are real, except they don't come back from the dead. Ooh, spooky! <laughs> so mummies are wrapped in bandages and have been preserved in such a way that won't allow them to decay. Um, this is what uh, was done in Egypt, and they believe um, this would allow you to live forever in the afterlife. And forever. <laughs> right. And disturbing the dead would release the curse of the pharaohs. So you mix this with a little magic and imagination. You have a stiff-legged, walking, powerful on dead filled with vengeance for disturbing their afterlife. But Better watch out. That didn't stop people from doing so anyways. No, we like to explore as humans. Clostridium botulinum, what is it? It's a causative agent of botulism and the reason why we have Botox. Gotta keep those cheeks perky. Yeah, and the mortality rate of, of botulism is quite high um, because it causes difficulty breathing, muscle paralysis, and even death. So, that would make your mortality high. So think about it. You're conscious, but you can't breathe because your diaphragm can't contract. Now that is horrible. Yeah. However, this microbe can be found basically everywhere from uh, soil to the ocean. And for the most part is harmless. So then why do we get botulism? Well, it's all because of a toxin it produces. Not just one, but seven toxins. What are the names of the toxins? Toxin A to toxin G. Oh, do they all cause harm to people? 
No, only uh, three out of the seven do A, B, and E. Mm. And so what this toxin does, it clings to the nerve endings that connect to muscles. So those nerve, those neurons can't sick, send signals to the muscles. So therefore they can't contract. Oh. And so they produce this toxin when there is a uh, low acid, low sugar, low salt, and low oxygen. And where does that occur? Uh, in proper canning, usually. Home canning? Uh, not just home canning. It can happen in, uh, in uh, industrial canning, too. Oh, spooky. So as a side note, if you ever see a can that's bulging at the uh, food market, don't touch it because it could have botulism in it. What's the bulging from? It's a buildup of gas. Oh. That, that means something else is happening in there. Something you don't want. Mm. So as um, mentioned, we also use this as Botox. We use the toxin specifically as Botox. And as Tess said, we use it for injecting our wrinkles and making it look like we can't show proper emotions. But uh, cosmetics is not the only reason why we have Botox. Would you ever get Botox? Not unless I had one of these following conditions. What, what are the conditions? So it's been found that uh, Botox can improve severe underarm sweating, um, uncontrollable blinking, chronic migraines, and also an overactive bladder. Those seem all very different kinds of conditions. I mean, some of them, yeah, like sweating and blinking. But if you look at like blinking and bladder, um, those are very muscle related. So if you're paralyzing the muscle, that can reduce that. And sometimes chronic migraines can be uh, caused by tension. And that's like mm -hmm. your muscles contracting. I guess that makes sense then. Yeah. So if you think about it this way, if you get botulism infection, um, you're going to become as stiff as a mummy. Stiff as a mummy. Oh, and as a side note, botulism is, can also be found in honey. That's why you're not supposed to give it to babies. Oh, right. But it doesn't affect kids and adults because we can clear the toxin quickly enough. But babies, their uh, digestive tract is not developed enough. Mm -hmm. So they can get affected by the toxin. No honey for babies. No honey for babies. Just eat their serving of honey. Yeah, because it's so good. We done talking about mummies? We're done with the mummies. Moving on. The next one we're talking about is Yersinia pestis, which has a very special place in my heart. So if you don't know, Yersinia pestis caused the Black Death, the plague, if you will. So Halloween has a lot to do with death from murder mysteries to the Grim Reaper to remembering loved ones that have gone from this world. The darkness that shrouds our Halloween tradition reminds us of the darkness to come and the darkness of the past, but also helps us to remember the good that can come from the bad. So I don't think it's much of a stretch to connect Yersinia pestis, the causal agent of the infamous Black Death, with death itself as a Halloween theme. Would you agree? I would completely agree, especially when you learn about its history. So let's talk a little bit about Yersinia pestis and human history. So throughout history, many have tried to conquer great spans of land from Napoleon to Alexander the Great and the British Empire, many others. But few have been so successful in their conquests as Yersinia pestis. See what I did there? Kind of rhymed. Nice. Nice. So let's go back to the year 1347. A group of townspeople went to greet their family members who had just been abroad fighting in the war. Although they expected some fallen sailors, many were hopeful their loved ones would emerge victorious. 12 ships docked at the Sicilian port and what emerged was horrifying. Oh no. Bodies were stacked in large piles and the smell of decaying quickly swept through the city. Weak and sickly sailors staggered out of ships covered in grotesque black boils, oozing blood and pus. The dead and dying were ordered to sail out to sea and never return again. But it was too late. Dun, dun, dun. 
The Black Death is often described as one of the greatest catastrophes there ever was, wiping out some 20 to 50 million people in the 14th century, forever altering our future as a species. And this was all caused by Yersinia pestis, which is typically found um, in rodents, particularly in rats and their fleas, but squirrels, prairie dogs, chipmunks, bulls, and rabbits can also harbor Yersinia pestis. And what is so diabolical about Yersinia pestis is its biofilm. It's actually a lot more disgusting when you dive deep into the biofilm that Yersinia pestis uh, produces. So John, can you tell us what a biofilm is? So it's this structure that one or more bacteria uh, produce and it, protect, it protects uh, the bacteria from their outside environment. I always think of it like a blanket. Like the bacteria just put like a little blanket around themselves and it makes them feel safe and cozy. I think of it more like a condo, to be honest, because you have all different types of bacteria living okay. there. That's true. And there are different levels and condo might work as well. But the biofilm in Yersinia pestis serves an additional purpose, which is so insanely diabolical. I can't help but tell you what it is. You want to know? I want to know. All right. So this biofilm also starves the flea um, so that the food that the flea... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, your, your like, left eye was just like... Mm, twitching. You were just like staring at me. <laughs> so, it was so intense of a spasm. You need some botulism for your eyebrow. <laughs> some botulism for my eyebrow. Calm, calm down. I get so excited about microbes. I know. All right. Anyways, the second thing about biofilm. So, the extensive biofilm of your city of pestis is so thick the flea's food can't reach the gut. It's essentially starving the flea, which makes the flea want to eat and eat and eat and eat because it's so hungry. And how do fleas eat? They bite and they bite and they bite and they bite. So they go into this feeding frenzy and they violently bite and eat whatever it can. And every time that it bites, it also regurgitates a little bit of what it previously ate. Yeah, it throws up because it can't get that food all the way down to its stomach because of the biofilm. So think of it this way. A flea is biting you and vomiting into that bite. And part of that vomit is our lovely and diabolical and most clever microbe, Yersinia pestis. So uh, it's thought that rat fleas made the jump to humans and bite them and transmit the bacteria. And then we have the plague, although you can also get the Black Death through um, contact with infectious droplets or tissues or fluids. So when you have um, this environment that we had in this 14th century, when all of the people, all the poor people were living really close to each other, there were no sanitary practices, and people had no clue what a microbe was, you can see how quickly this could spread across cities. It wasn't until a hundred years later that during the third great plague outbreak that a French microbiologist, Alexandra Yersin, for whom the bacteria is named after, discovered what the causal agent was. I also want to note um, that in the same year, 1894, that Alexandra Yersin discovered Yersinia pestis. Another microbiologist also discovered it independently. This was a Japanese bacteriologist, Kitasato Shibasaburu. Not sure on the pronunciation there, but um, but of course we the namesake of this microbe was given to Yersinia pestis, and that is what we know of it today. As a side note, Kitasato um, was a very well-known Japanese microbiologist. And he was up for a Nobel Prize, actually, um, for his research. But in the end, the prize went to his German colleague. So Kitasato, you have a Nobel Prize in our hearts. So let's talk a little bit about the disease. So what happens is once the microbe goes in, it will get to your lymph nodes. And then two other membrane uh, areas, 
such as your groin and your armpit, and will begin to swell, forming buboes, hence the bubonic plague. These buboes can be as big as apples. Um, could you imagine like an apple growth just like growing from your groin? No. Oh, that's got to be uncomfortable walking. Only the size of the egg. Oh, that's so much smaller. <laughs> a lot more manageable. Yeah. So typically at this point, once you start forming buboes, you got about seven to 10 days left to your life. And these seven to 10 days are not fun. You have a fever, you have chills, you have diarrhea, you have aches, you have pain, you have an unpleasant odor that you can't escape because it's coming from your own body and it's the 14th century, so you can't even take a shower. And I don't think the perfumes were even good at that time. And then liquids are oozing from mm, like everywhere. Sounds pleasant, huh? Mm. Mm. Yeah you don't want the plague. But I also wanted to compare this um, historic pandemic to our current pandemic and how we are at both the disadvantages and advantages compared to our 14th century brethren. Ancestors? Go ancestors. 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 So in today's pandemic, we are at a disadvantage because of our love of travel and the necessity of travel in our in our current global economy. And as we travel more and we are connecting with people from around the world, we can spread diseases much faster, which is what we saw with our current pandemic. However, if you think back to the 14th century, um, they could only the fleas could travel by boat. They could travel by people but they couldn't travel much further than that. So the spread is uh, much slower in in the fact of the amount that it can spread at one time. However, it did spread pretty far based on people not understanding what was causing the disease. And so today we're at a much better, um, we're at a better advantage over the previous pandemics because we have science. Um, And thanks to science, we know the causal agent of our current pandemic of COVID-19. We know that it's a viral disease. And we know that um, washing our hands is a great way to prevent it as well as face masks. So in the 14th century, all they had was the wrath of God as a causal agent for anything bad in their lives. Um, And so this caused people to do terrible things um, that did not help the plague go away, such as persecuting non-Christians, particularly Jewish populations, or whipping themselves with heavy leather straps. Mm, Nothing like good old flagellation. Yeah, I'm not really sure why you think that was going to make things go away or help, but... Well, they felt like they were uh, sinning, so the only way to repent was for hurting themselves. That's true. Doctors, if you can call them that, would also um, decide that bloodletting might be good or that apple size boil on the side of your thigh. Maybe we should just like pop that with a needle, um, let the the liquid just kind of ooze out, um, which sounds miserable. And those things can cause infection, which causes death. So not a very good cure, but it might put you out of your misery faster. Hmm. Also, I don't remember which uh, pandemic, it was either the first or the second where of course, uh, the whole um, miasma was uh, thought at the time. And so one of the things they tried was burning copious amounts of sulfur in the air. Mm, So pleasant. So although it may seem primitive, hand washing and masks are number one defense against all sicknesses and could have helped a, a lot in the plague of the 14th century. So the plague today, we still have it, although it is way less prevalent in our society. So how did the plague end? Very similarly to how we are currently trying to contain and end our own pandemic by means of social distancing. People suspecting of being sick or at high risk, such as sailors, were quarantined until they were deemed safe to enter the city. Today, this plague of the past is not so scary anymore. Each year, the WHO estimates there are only about 3,000 cases worldwide. Although we still see instances of the plague in Africa, Asia, and the Western United States, it doesn't cause quite as much trouble as it did and can be treated with antibiotics. So just remember, even though they're cute, don't hug a prairie dog. Yes, definitely don't do that. And just a few more tidbits on Yersinia pestis, which I like to tell this story. Um... Our dog is named Yersinia, and she's an all-white dog named after the Black Plague. 
And my grandmother tells me that she once had the Black Plague. Not really sure on the, I haven't really fact-checked that, but she did grow up where prairie dogs were prevalent. um, So she could have had the plague. That's really interesting. You should really dive into that sometime. Yeah. I'd like to hear the story of that. Yeah, I should ask my grandmother. All right. So we'll close on Yersinia pestis. So, microbial nation, that's the end of part one. That's right. This is going to be a two-parter. So join us next time for part two. And thank you so, so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe and share with a friend. You can find us at microbigals.com. That is M-I-C-R-O-B-I-G-A-L-S.com. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Microbigals. So remember, feed Feed your your mind, feed your your guts, guts, make make your your microbes microbes love you lots. lots.